Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, well, let me say good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to a uh, J. Mitra scientific webinar on the subject of procalcitonin guided targeted antibiotic therapy. Our speaker for the day is Professor Ashok Ratan, a name who needs no introduction, alumnus of the Darbanga Medical College and the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Professor Ratan has been in the space of medical treatment and diagnosis for over two and a half decades, maybe three decades, if I'm not wrong. And uh, Sir has been at the forefront of medical education as well. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. Sir. Good evening. Today we will deal with procalcitonin guided target antibiotic therapy. Acute respiratory tract infection uh, is the most frequent cause of medical concentration. Actually, acute respiratory tract infection is a heterogeneous set of conditions and it consists of upper respiratory tract infection, lower respiratory tract infection, which could be acute bronchitis, acute lobar pneumonia, acute exacerbation of COPD and community acquired pneumonia. Can you ask them to not do till six? Now in the outpatient department, antibiotics are mostly prescribed for res acute respiratory condition. 44% of all antibiotics are given for acute respiratory tract infections. Pneumonia has both medical impact as well as social impact. Pneumonia is a, a frequent disorder, about 25 cases per, uh, per 10,000 population. It's more frequent in less than five and more than 60 years of age. Uh, it's more common in the winter. There's high mortality is the frequent, uh, fifth frequent cause of, of death. Uh, death is more in less than five and more than 60 years of age. And there are frequent comorbidities. There is also social impact because it takes a lot of resources. And in USA, the annual cost is about $17 billion. In spite of all the money that is spent, as you know, in the West, they always try to make the diagnosis first. But unfortunately, in about 60% of cases, the actual diagnosis is not established. And in majority of cases, it's viral, which is the causative agent for the infection. A study from Europe also indicated that if even if you divide into lower respiratory tract infection and community acquired pneumonia, bacterial infections are found in about 11%, 38% only causing viral infections and 10 having both bacterial and viral infections but that would account for 41% of the total lower respiratory tract infection. In CAP also, it, viral, viral pneumonia seem to be more common than bacterial pneumonia, and the causative agent is identified in about 40% of cases. Now, uh, we know that the diagnostic methods used vary from place to place. In our own experience, Sputum culture has not been very rewarding. Urine antigen for streptococcus pneumonia and legionella pneumophilia also are not too good. Blood culture is sometimes useful in children. X-ray chest is normally the test that is done. In the modern medicine, PCR or RT-PCR or multiplex PCR antigen detection is added on super added over these traditional methods. 
in the recent past, Biomeru has introduced Biofire, which tests not only the common bacteria which cause infection, but also the resistant genes, atypical bacteria, which are very difficult to culture, as well as uh, the viruses which are associated with acute pneumonia. So in one hour time, when you do this kind of comprehensive assessment, the detection of something or the other becomes more possible. When I was in Dubai, we used to use C genes multiplex PCR, where with one sample, we could pick up 16 viruses and five bacteria. Overall, the feeling is that in respiratory tract infection, where antibiotics are most frequently given, in at least 30%, the antibiotics are not of any use, are not indicated. And CDC has proposed various mechanisms looking at what is unnecessary, and red is unnecessary, and you see on the slide, everything is un unnecessary according to them. Viral pneumonia, influenza, middle ear infection, bronchitis, bronch bronchiolitis, viral upper respiratory tract infection do not need to be treated with antibiotics. Now, why people are worried is because in places where they monitor both consumption as well as development of resistance, they notice that there's a direct correlation with the use or overuse of antibiotics and the development of resistance. In India, Dr. Chand Vatal from Sir Gangaram Hospital seems to be the only one who monitors the consumption as well as resistance. But overall, many persons have indicated that in India, antibiotics are overused the consumption has risen from 2001 to 2010. It has risen by 62%. And uh, worldwide, the consumption in this 21st century has increased by 36%. It's been predicted that there is an unseen, there's an, there's an hidden or invisible pandemic which we are experiencing and by, 2000, uh, by 2050, 10 million cases might die because they suffer from resistant infections where no antibiotics are available. I have always maintained that antibiotic use leads to four things, whether antibiotics are administered on the prescription of a learned professor or of a quack. Whenever you use antibiotics, four things happen simultaneously. One is clinical cure. That is what we want. But the use of antibiotics will lead to inhibition of non-pathogenic bacteria. It will lead to selection of resistant mutants. And it will also lead to toxicity on side effects if the targets are present on human body rather than on the bacteria. In prudent use of antibiotic, we want to use it in such a condition that the clinical cure far overreaches the inhibition of pathogenic bacteria, selection of resistant mutants, and toxicity or side effects. And that's why we try various methods for prudent use of antibiotic. One of the prudent use of antibiotic is that we wish we had a biomarker which could guide us to show that there's a bacterial infection and not a viral infection. The wish list for this biomarker is that it should help us in get better clinical correlation, better, better clinical outcome, so that we have better clinical decision-making. Uh, there's no negative effect on mortality. 
decrease in incidence of clostridial difficile infection after antibiotic use and decrease in adverse events. And of course, because we're now using a biomarker, which will increase our cost, we want its use to lead to less cost. The evidence indicate that whenever a person has tried to use an algorithm, which includes procalcitonin, it has led to less use of antibiotics. The number of days in which antibiotics are given are decreased. by various authors. Uh, it's also been shown that between procalcitonin group and control group, there is no difference in death. So that the use of procalcitonin and holding back antibiotics as a consequence does not increase the chances of accidental deaths. Those who are economically minded, and all administrators are, they look at what is the cost saving. And in a study in America, in one year's time, they said when, when they started using antibiotics, only when a certain level of procalcitonin was present and withholding antibiotics, when it was less than that, they saved $6 million in that year on antibiotics alone. So it would suggest that if we can decide between bacterial infection and viral infection and use only for bacterial antibiotics for bacterial infection, we would have to give antibiotics for lesser number of days, have no an increase in mortality, and we would save a lot of money. Various parameters have tried, been tried. One was procalcitonin, but the procalcitonin's patent was held by a company which had big instruments located in central labs. And since the logistics was challenging, to get the sample to the central lab, to get the report back before you prescribe antibiotic, it was not, this strategy would not have worked unless we had a quantitative point of care testing. Point of care testing is necessary for this strategy to work. And this have to be quantitative, not qualitative card test. Fortunately, Thermo Fisher, who had the patent, were the first one in, to introduce a point of care testing.
luckily after thermo fisher got that going there are many other companies which have also made uh, point of care testing available one company is an indian company which makes the test available at very reasonable price when this was compared between a standard method in the lab with the new method you find that the correlation was excellent and reproducibility at both low as well as high values was very good with a coefficient of variation of less than 3% so what is pct procalcitonin is a 116 amino acid precursor of calcitonin and it is produced by thyroid c cells and neuroendocrine cells of the lungs calcitonin is involved in calcium hemostasis while procalcitonin is not involved many other cell can produce procalcitonin after specific stimulation but lack enzyme to convert pct into calcitonin thereafter whenever there is a stimulation of these cells they will produce excessive amount of pct which will not be converted into calcitonin and this will pour out into the blood increasing the levels of pct so procalcitonin is the precursor and calcitonin is the 31 amino acid long uh, pct would be the one which is the precursor that is made and as you see the thyroidal cells will have the um, have the messenger rna for uh, calcitonin and cal procalcitonin will be produced it will be processed in the uh, it will be processed and only calcitonin will be released so normally no procalcitonin is found in the blood and only calcitonin will be found which is used for calcium homeostasis but under so under normal condition the thyroid cells will which have messenger rna as well as the enzyme to convert pct to ct would be there and they were, since it is immediately processed to calcitonin you would not find procalcitonin without stimulus but when bacterial infection occurs inflammatory and inflammatory host response is initiated then mostly by lps which will lead to production of procalcitonin by not only the thyroid and the lung tissues but many many tissues and since those cells do not have the enzyme to convert procalcitonin into calcitonin the excessive amount of procalcitonin will pour out in the blood and that is what we can measure fortunately lps is a very strong stimulus for pct production 
On the other hand, viral uh, infection, which lead to production of interferon gamma, will dampen the production of procalcitonin. So procalcitonin will not rise in case of viral infection and would be very high in case of bacterial infection. So if you're looking for a specific biomarker to differentiate between bacterial infection and viral infection, procalcitonin is the one. Here it shows that whether it is white blood cells, peritoneal macrophages, spleen, lung, liver, kidney, adrenal, brain, spain, spine, pancreas, stomach, small intestine, colon, heart, muscle, skin, visceral fat, testes, all of them show that PCT production is increased by the gene on stimulation by bacterial infection. This, uh, this, bactic, this uh, inf inflammation or in, will lead to PCT, which will come out in the circulation. And since PCT is in far more excess with these cells, there would be high level of, uh, of PCT in the blood. Now, one, for, uh, one, uh, one of the strongest point is that PCT rises by, uh, by four, uh, starts rising by two to four uh, hours and reaches a peak by about eight hours. And then it has a life of about 24 hours. So PCT starts rising in two hours time, reaches a peak between six to eight hours time and half, and its life is 20, half life is 24 hours. This seems to be a better kinetic than any other that you can think of. For example, in IL-6, the rise is quicker. Before you can pick it up, it starts falling. Uh, same is the case with IL-10 or TNF-alpha. So both IL-10 and TNF-alpha would have fallen as well as IL-6 would have fallen by the time uh, we are ready to test. That's about six hours time. On the other hand, PCT starts rising by two hours, reaches a peak by 12 hours, and is there by 24 hours, and then starts falling. While CRP will rise later, would take more than six hours to start rising, and then it is there for a longer time. So PCT seems to be the, and from looking at the re, uh, receiver re operating characteristics and looking at the sensitivity and specificity, when you compare PCT with CRP, IL-6, and lactate, you would find that uh, PCT as a marker and as a sensitive and specific marker for bacterial infection has a negative predictive value of 90% and a positive predictive value of 94%. Another feature of PCT is that PCT will arise and then will start falling if a, if appropriate antibiotic has been initiated. So if you measure PCT every 24 hours, once in every 24 hours, if the PCT is remaining steady or increasing, that would mean that the antibiotic is not working. While if antibiotics are effective, the titer will start falling the next day. Here they've shown that after a PCT, which has started rising between two to six hours, reaching a peak between 12 to 24 hours. If, you, uh, if there is inadequate infection control and inadequate uh, treatment, then the PCT will remain high or increase. On the other hand, if effective treatment is there, then every day the levels of PCT will fall. They've also noticed that this has effect on mortality. If the decline is decline in PCT level from baseline, especially if the person comes later in, in, in the care of the hospital, which have PCT facilities, and they find that the decline is less than 80% from peak PCT, then the mortality is 20%. 
while if the decline is more than 80% from peak PCT, then the mortality is nearly halved. So to understand PCT, we would say that normal value is less than 0 0.08 nanogram per ml because normally there's no PCT in blood. It starts elevating three to six hours or two to six hours after bacterial infection. It will be, it will reach its peak between six to 12 hours. It has a half-life of about 24 hours, cleared mainly by proteolysis. Some renal clearance is also there. May, may be raised after major trauma or after surgery, not increased in viral infections. So there was a, 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 a consensus meeting and uh, in Berlin. And after the consensus meeting in Berlin, they had a consensus meeting in Asia. And then it was decided that procalcitonin guided antibiotic stewardship in Asia-Pacific countries uh, should also be tried. And there they indicated uh, that it could be tried for non-critical critically ill patients, and they suggested that what should be the baseline and how it should work. Similarly, for critically ill patients also, the consensus was there that PCT should be used. Uh, it is a complicated slide, so I'll try to simplify it, saying that guideline for initiation of antibiotic PCT has value in deciding when to initiate an, uh, antibiotic therapy. If the PCT value is less than 0.25 nanogram per ml, then antibiotics are strongly discouraged. If the value is 0.5 and below, antibiotics are discouraged. If the value is 0.5 and less than one, then it is encouraged that you should give antibiotics. But if the PCT value is more than one nanogram per ml, then it is strongly encouraged that you should start antibiotics. The best place for this PCT point of care testing is in the OPD next to a chest physician or a pediatric uh, pediatrician. There, the PCT should be done if a person comes with chest infection. We know that 40% of them maybe because of viral infection. Now, before deciding on giving antibiotic, PCT should be obtained. If the PCT value is 0.5 and above or one and above, then antibiotics must be given. If on the other hand, it is 0.5 and below 0.5, then you should hold back the antibiotics and watch the patient for a longer duration before deciding whether antibiotics need to be given. On the other hand, if a patient is already on antibiotic, to decide whether you should stop the antibiotic or you should continue the antibiotic or change antibiotic, again, you must look at the algorithm. Here it will be that if, the, if you're taking PCT values after every 24 hours, if the PCT value is 0.25, below to, uh, 0.25, then it is strongly in, encouraged that you discontinue the antibiotic. If the antibiotic is more than 0.25 and less than 0.5, or decline of more than 80% from peak value, then you can continue, uh, you can either continue or uh, Continuation is discouraged, while if it is more than 0.5 or decline is less than 80%, then continuation is, incre uh, is encouraged. On the other hand, if the, if the PCD value is 0.5 and above or it has increased, then continuation is encouraged, but you should also see whether there is resistance by, because it gives you time for collecting the samples and doing microbiology, which takes about 48 hours before you get the result. But if the PCT levels remain over 
0.5% are increasing, then it is strongly enc encouraged that you should use PCT. In case of uh, sepsis, you should do blood culture along with, uh, along with clinical scores, and this would add value to the diagnosis of PCT. As I've already indicated that if you see how much money is saved by PCT guided antibiotic, agreed that uh, PCT itself will cost some money, but now a uh, cheap instrument is available, um, which is not very expensive and the cost per test is very low. So the cost of test is much lower now when you do PCT testing than it was when you used to send it in the, to the central lab. And this will save a lot of money for, uh, which has been wasted on unnecessary antibiotic use. And overall, the society will gain. It's also been suggested that in places where PCT is not available or is out of reach, then CRP guided use could be done, especially in PCT. Uh, the hypothesis of that was that PCT is less than 0.5 nanogram per ml was associated with lower level of CRP. And uh, in 229 COVID-19 patients were studied CRP value below the geometric mean of the entire patient population has a negative predictive value for PCT 0.5 of 97%. So if PCT is, if CRP is low, then you can predict that PCT will also be low. And, uh, and especially the negative predictive value was 100% at 48 hours of admission. So a CRP guided PCT testing algorithm can reduce cost and support of antibiotic stewardship strategy in COVID-19. This, uh, they, they had tried to say that, uh, you, as you notice here, the sensitivity of PC at baseline was 94% and negative predictive value was 97%. If you do after 48 hours time and you find the CRP is low, then PCT will also be low and that has a negative predictive value of 100%. So if CRP is low, that would mean PCT is low, and that means the person is not suffering from bacterial infection, and so no antibiotics need to be given to this COVID patient. If after 48 hours of admission, his CRP is low, so you presume that his PCT will also be low. So overall, you would say, where is the evidence? As I've tried to indicate, there have been over the last decade, there have been a number of observational study as well as interventional study. And both the studies indicate that PCT is an indicator of bacterial infection and PCT, you would be in initiation of the antibiotics or in continuation of stopping the antibiotics, PCT could help you guide uh, to make the right decision. I thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Saab. Uh, as always, you, you, know, you took a topic which is at the peripheries of our understanding and you brought it into the uh, mainstream of our you know, awareness level. And uh, sir, I had a couple of questions here, you know, because I was, I was listening to you intently and I figured that uh, over the last two years, there's been a heavy, heavy use of antibiotics, you know, and uh, call it the COVID syndrome or whatever, but we've had a misguided use of antibiotics to a certain extent. What kind of steps do you recommend apart from just PCT in, in terms of antibiotic stewardship? Uh, that would help, uh, you know, make this situation better. What are the two or three key points that uh, doctors and medical practitioners need to look out for to ensure the miss? Uh, to, no, you know, there's no misuse of antibiotics. See, um, the uh, I guess people have a feeling that even if it is viral infection, 
if you give antibiotics, that will prevent bacterial infection. We all know that, yes, uh, viral infection can predispose to, to bacterial infection. But it has been seen that prophylactic use of antibiotics will not prevent the appearance of super infection by, by bacteria. And by prophylactic use of antibiotics, we will kill out all the sensitive bacteria. And when the super infection occurs, then it will be by resistant, more resistant bacteria. So we would not, by using antibiotics unnecessarily, we would have increased the chances of the person suffering from resistant bacteria and promoted the spread of resistant bacteria. So it is better to withhold and to give antibiotics, uh, antibiotics at good concentration once there is evidence of bacterial infection. But if there's no evidence of bacterial infection, and as I try to indicate that there is evidence that PCT is a clear-cut indicator of bacterial infection. It is not raised in viral infection. CRP, which is more non-specific, can also act as a surrogate marker under the presumption that if CRP is low, then PCT will also be low. So it is a, a correlation for COVID. So to, do, uh, to admit a patient and to start antibiotics is not wise. On the other hand, now, as you know, there are two drugs available approved by the US FDA as well as Drug Controller of India and permission given to Indian pharmaceutical companies to manufacture the, the drug and make it available at cheap rates. These both are oral and they have activity against COVID. Paxlovid is made by, was discovered by Pfizer and molpiravir is discovered by Merck. Both of them are oral. They need to be taken morning and evening for five days as soon as a person gets RT-PCR. So one is to protect yourself by vaccination. Absolutely. If you are vaccinated, there's clear-cut evidence that the infection will not go to severity or death. It will protect you and of course, it seems that the protection is from three to six months. So the protection is not very long lasting. If more than six months have passed, you should now take a, take a booster dose. Okay. And if still a person gets RT-PCR positive, then immediately they should start either Paxlovid or Mol Molnipuravid. The only problem with Paxlovid is that it is metabolized by CYP450 enzymes in the liver so that if a person is taking other drugs, they could be drug-drug interaction. That is a point of contention out here. It's a, it's a matter to be looked at. And so that a person should not self-medicate, uh, should go to the doctor and tell him everything that he has comorbidity with or he is taking drugs. So the doctor will then consult a pharmacologist and they work out which drugs will have interaction, which will not have interaction. That is one. And molnipuravir has shown in animal toxicity to be teratogenic. So molnipuravir is not indicated from, for ladies in their reproductive age group oh. or for children below 18 years of age. So there are so a lot of caveats that come with this particular... Yes, uh, set both, of there are two drugs, they are available, but uh, it's to be used for five days and it could be life-saving for those who have comorbidity. So, but they are available. Those, that means new methodologies are available and there's evidence that both the drugs will work against Omicron. So whether it is Omicron, they work against Delta, they work against all others, but they also work against Omicron. Right. So you had a discussion, you know, one of your slides talked about CR, you know, the uh, CRP and the PCT correlation that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But in, in whatever I have read about uh, P, PCT and CRP, it is indicated that PS, PCT would be a better marker 
for bacterial infection it would be a, it would be a better marker for early detection of bacterial infection as well right yes that's I right that's what you were trying C to convey as well see crp rises later so crp cannot be used as an early marker and crp rises non specifically even pct rises non specifically when i was in madhyanta and there was a lot of liver transplant patients we would see that immediately after liver transplant the values were very high and then every day if the patient is is recovering every day the values will keep falling so in after heavy trauma pct values are high okay but uh, they will decrease if there is no bacterial infection they they keep decreasing and if there is viral infection also they'll decrease because viral infection will produce interferon gamma and interferon gamma will suppress the production of pct sir uh, any pro, you know you uh, you have given us um, in the course of your presentation you made several references to using pct as an early marker and like you just justified at this point of time uh, for hospitals where should they actually be doing the test as a protocol of you know to ensure that minimal use of antibiotics or let's put it optimal use of antibiotics yeah see uh, hospitals will use antibiotics so uh, in in icu you don't want to stop using antibiotics I, antibiotics are life savers absolutely but so uh, so for that they should they should have the sensitivity pattern of the isolates in the last year so the microbiology department to every icu they must give a circulate what are the bacteria isolated from various tissues and what is the sensitivity pattern so that immediately when the patient comes they have a choice of choosing whichever antibiotics they feel is the most appropriate so that will be that is the empiric treatment along with that uh, at that moment pct may not have a role because they would trust their judge their clinical judgment first so they should give the antibiotics then along with that they can take uh, take baseline procalcitonin and one day after pro procalcitonin if the procalcitonin on the first day was less than 1 and subsequently was less than 1 then they can stop antibiotic or if antibiotics were given and the and the procalcitonin is falling once the procalcitonin falls below 0.5 that is the time to stop antibiotic as you know sometimes they say give antibiotics for 14 days sometimes they say 21 days now those are arbitrary if the bacteria is not there to keep on giving antibiotics is now selecting for resistant mutants so you should give antibiotics only as long as the offending bacteria is there but in icu i would suggest that they use pct for deciding when to stop giving antibiotic okay. on the other hand in opd this should be in the clinic uh, it should be next to the chest physician or uh, pediatrician and they should when a person comes with chest symptoms and since that is chances of that being being viral is going to be more than 40% so there only if the pct is more than 1 should they initiate um, antibiotic treatment if not they should give symptomatic treatment and ask them to come the next day if they require that way prudent use of antibiotic absolutely that makes a lot of sense sir. and i wish somebody had uh, you know like you have spoken about this today but at some level the government needs to put in putting out white papers they need to be putting out proper guidelines on the use of this are there any established guidelines given to us by the icmr on this particular topic i have not uh, this this as i said there's an international guideline and there's asia pacific guideline because uh, some of the tropical fevers may also cause increase in pct so that blind following uh international guidelines may not be the right thing to do you know uh, we we need to naturally every clinician must have must use his clinical judgment but those guidelines have indicated unless you prove to the contrary instead of not following it and saying that okay you prove prove that it is right 
because that kind of research will take time and uh, some academics uh, have other priorities than producing guidelines for india <laughs> very true sir well thank you so much sir that was a very informative session and you know i'm sure those who attended have benefited immensely uh, as always uh, mr ritesh mahajan will drop by and uh, you know give you the certificate in person but for now uh, please accept this small token of thanks and uh, so we look forward to meeting with you again in the month of june or uh, second week or third week of june if possible and we'd love to have a session on vector borne diseases with you sir i'll call you and discuss that with you offline sir thank you very yes. much all right thank you everybody thank you. and uh, thank we look forward to seeing you now on the 20th of may for our next jmitra scientific webinar thank you have a good day god bless